Have your Bibles. We'll kind of be in a couple different places, but be ready to go. We've been going the last, uh, this will be the, the last of a three week series called Put It to Death. We've been putting some things to death. Of course, uh, Easter's coming where, where there's new life. Jesus raised to new life. But before that, we're going to kill some things. And so the first week, uh, we killed the fake Jesus, the, the Jesus with the small J. We killed the, the, the warrior Jesus, you know, where, where he's going to come with a sword and conquer and, and liberate the people and start this whole new thing. And, of course, he said, my kingdom is eternal. If, I, if it wasn't, my people would come, and they'd, they'd, they'd kick all your butts, and, and we would win. But that's not what my kingdom is. We, so we put that to death. We put to death good moral Jesus because, you know, those that don't believe in him, they say he's a good moral teacher. And he does teach good morals, but that, yet he says he's God. And so if he says he's God, then he's a liar. And if he's, still, if he's a liar, then he can't be a good moral teacher, right? So, so we put that thing to death. We put to death the fact that he's a created being because the scriptures say that everything was created by him and for him and before anything was him and he created it all. So if he created it all, he can't be a created being, right? That's pretty obvious. And then he also put to death this idea that he's a multiple choice savior. He's one of many when Jesus uh, clearly says that he is the way, the truth, and the life and no one gets to the Father except through me. So we put that to death to uh, because we want to live this abundant life that he came to to deliver he promised that in john 10 10 and so to ha- enjoy this abundant life we've got to really put our faith in the real and only jesus that actually has some power and so that's what we did we put the other ones to death so we could empower the real uh, what we have to do also personally is kill a little bit of ourself because that gets in the way if we're going to have an abundant life, we have to become like Jesus, not like a better, more improved Moses. We have to be a completely different person. And Paul says it right. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's the way to accomplish the abundant life, to be Christ-like, not to be a better Moses, not to be a better Kelly, not to be a better Candy, but to be Jesus. So I kind of made up this silly little, um, this little image, but basically it's this. If you're walking on the road, people should be able to see you and look and see a guy in a robe and sandals. They should see Jesus when they see you, that you less of you, more of him. And that's the process. So we died, we died to ourselves. We killed ourselves last week. I, you look great for dead people. So this week, this week is, 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 is another week. We're going to kill something. But, um, you know, it's funny. Easter is upon us, and, and it's a big holiday, you know. And, and, and churches across the world are filled with people that don't usually go to church, they're filled with people that aren't even believers, really. Maybe they're inquiring. Maybe their wife made them go. Maybe they've just been pick, 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 pick by their kid or their wife or their husband long enough, and they finally said, just get off my back, woman, I'll go. Just don't make me pray. Don't make me take that cracker. Don't make me drink that jungle juice that's Jesus' blood. That freaks me out. Don't make me do that. And, and churches are filled with people on, on that day. And they're also filled on Christmas. Those are the two big Christian. Look at the calendar. Those are the big days, you know. Christmas and Easter. You know, the, the birth of Jesus and then the resurrection of Jesus. They're the big holiday. Whose favorite Christian holiday, if you will? Whose favorite is, Chris, is Christmas? Raise your hand. Whose favorite is Easter? Who doesn't have any favorites? Who doesn't care? Awesome. Nice. I'm just kidding. Gotcha. So, but those are the two popular ones, right? And, 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 and I don't understand that because, I don't know, everyone's got their own opinion, right? But I think that, that and I hate the name, like Good Friday, that's the best holiday. That, that's the greatest holiday that there is. That's the day that Jesus goes to the cross. That's the greatest holiday there is, but it has the lamest name. Seriously, like, it's like going to the pound or the pet store and getting, and, and getting this little brown puppy and you come home and you, everyone's excited and they say, what do you want to call it? And you go, I don't know, brown puppy. Like, where's the imagination? Good Friday? That, I mean, and it's not, it's, I was talking to Mark about it earlier, it's not even celebrated. Like, no one even really celebrates Good Friday. It's the day Jesus goes to the cross. It's the centerpiece of all civilization, all of time. It's the cross of Christ, and nobody even celebrates it. It's the weirdest thing. I think the name is the reason. It's the lamest name of any holiday. I came up with some other ones for you. I want to choose, maybe popular vote, we'll pick a different one, okay? Because I can't stand Good Friday. Let me, I get a couple of different ones here for you. How about this one? Jesus and the terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. 
I think that's a much better day. I think it's a much better name. You know why? Because I understand that Jesus goes to the cross and he dies so that you can actually have life. So that's really cool. But for him? I mean, seriously? He gets, he gets whipped and beaten and slapped and spit on and he's in the garden saying, Dad, I really don't want to do this. Like, it wasn't a good day for him. The end result was good for us, but it wasn't a very, very good day for him. So I think this is probably a, very, a much more appropriate name for, for Good Friday. But for those who, who are a little bit more uh, on the fence, a little more politically correct, you're not quite sure what you should call it. Whether it was a, because you know you could say, well, it's a very, hey, it's a very, it's a very good day because he was crucified for me and I get eternal life. Or it's a very bad day because he had to go through all that stuff. Like, who would say that that's a good thing? He had to go through that for you. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that upon my Jesus, right? Every time I see that or I hear about it, it makes me sad because I'm the one who put him there. So it's not really a good day. The end result is good, but maybe we're a little bit confused with today. So maybe we'll call it this. Mixed feelings day. I, would, that's, I think that's fair. I think that probably most of us neutral people that are too, too scared to make a choice, like when your spouse asks you, well, where do you want to go to dinner? I don't know, where do you want to go? Well, what do you, I don't know, what do you want to do? And you just can't make a decision? That's your day right there. You, you can call it mixed feelings day. Here's, the, here's my favorite. This is, this is the one I choose. And, and I want to read this with you. This is the, I think this is what it should be called. Can any of you read that writing? It's kind of small, but can we read it with me? Let's read it together. The greatest day, I can't believe God loves me this much. How in the world can I ever thank him? I'm going to tell everybody about this. Woohoo! I get into heaven. This is the single most important thing that has ever happened to me in everybody day. Yeah. That's what it should be called. That's the better name for our holiday. I think we should sign a petition and send it out. It will never make it. We should make t-shirts. We should make t-shirts. You know, it's an incredible day. Katie Johnson was reading the Bible the other day. You all know Katie, right? I don't know if she's in here. There's Katie. She's reading the Bible the other day. How many people have ever, like, reading the Bible, and you've read a section, you've read a hundred times, and you never see this, but you're reading something, and all of a sudden, something jumps up and goes like that. Woo! What? The day that he was, res that, not the day he was resurrected, the day he went to the cross, there were dead people coming out of their tombs. And there were naked people running through town. They're, they're, his disciples, were, they were trying to chase him down, and the kid strips his sheet off, and he's running through town naked, and there's zombies running around. This is like, it's like biblical Mardi Gras meets the walking dead. That's what's going on on this day, but it doesn't even get its own holiday. I don't understand that. Who cares about Christmas? This day is amazing. It's not Friday, by the way, today, but... This is the closest we're going to get to it. So we're going to celebrate the number one day right here today. Jesus on the cross. That's what I want to do. I want to do that. You know, I'm not ripping on the resurrection because next week I'm going to tell you how awesome the resurrection is because we need some fresh material, right? So I'm going to tell you how great the resurrection is. But without the resurrection, you know, the crucifixion is, is kind of meaningless, right? It's kind of meaningless if, if there's no resurrection then this guy goes to the cross but he claims to be god he claims to 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 be the strong thing this is an easter pun so you getting ready are you ready if jesus wants you to put all your eggs in his basket then then he has to be yeah so he has to be the strongest thing that there is so if death conquers him then he can't claim to be god he can't be the sufficient savior to take away your sin and enter you into to glory if he's not the most powerful entity the most powerful thing in all of the universe and so without the resurrection where he kicks death in the teeth there's there there's there's the crucifixion is meaningless as a matter of fact the scriptures will actually um, agree with that. And if you don't mind, uh, open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 17. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 agrees with this. I'm not making it up. Although it would be a pretty good story if I made it up. Make a good movie, this whole crucifixion and resurrection thing. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Look what the Bible says of this resurrection. 15, 17, just kind of holler when you're there. Holler. Holler. Yeah, right, Jared. <laughs> All right, y'all ready? 
It says this, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more pity, I'm sorry, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. See, <laughs> what it's saying is, is, is if, if Jesus just goes to the cross and he doesn't rise again, if you put all your hope into that basket and something conquers him, then your faith is a joke. You know what I'm saying? Like you're wasting your time. The, it's a total joke if Jesus does. I mean, can you imagine that? You're, you, you, you put your whole eternity into the hands of this, this quote unquote, I guess, supposed, you know, sufficient Savior, and he dies something conquers him, then that wouldn't be a very good savior at all. So he's saying like, if your hope is only for this life, you're just wasting your time. He loses, you lose, the whole church loses, and it becomes just this kind of a foolish little country club group and with no hope. So if Jesus doesn't raise and put death to death, it's a loss, and it's meaningless if he doesn't raise from the dead. So the resurrection must happen, but, y'all know how I feel about buts, but without the cross, there is no resurrection, right? The resurrection is amazing. He brings new life, but he has to die first before he's raised to new life. Without the cross, the resurrection lacks meaning. Just like the, without the resurrection, the crucifixion is meaningless. Well, same is true the opposite. Without the cross, the resurrection lacks meaning because without the cross, the resurrection is nothing more than a very cool story. And that's a very cool story of a guy on his own strength and his own desire and his own power goes into a grave and after three days of being cold and absolutely dead, stretched, beaten beyond recognition, stabbed with a spear through his lungs, he's dead and he's in the grave and he raises on his own power. Like, who would think that that's an amazing story if it accomplished nothing spiritual it's still wicked cool, right? It's wicked awesome. However, it lacks meaning without the cross because the depth of meaning lies in the fact that we get to participate in that resurrection. We get to participate in that resurrection. Yes, Christ has risen, but the scriptures tell us, and it's very true, that he is the first of a great harvest of all who have died belonging to him. These are huge words. Belonging to him. See, if you don't belong to him, then the resurrection is actually meaningless. As a matter of fact, it's not just meaningless to some. Actually, it would probably be a negative to some. Because after all, like, if, if everyone around you was winning the lottery except you, that would suck. If everyone, if a, if a billionaire walked in here right now and started handing out brand new Mercedes to every single person in here, except Eddie, that wouldn't be a positive for him, would it? So if everyone else is getting to enjoy glory and they have, they have heaven promised except you, that's not a positive. So it could bring a, a negative feeling to it. Who wants to see everybody else blessed around them? Everybody else, if you don't. But it's at the cross where God's love is most apparent. It's at the cross where the sins of all mankind are poured out on the only one who didn't deserve it. It's on the cross where entry into the kingdom eternal is declared. It's at the cross where this is all accomplished. Do me a favor and look at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. God tells us, how we're going to get in. Colossians chapter 1, written by Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the second part of verse 20, chapter 1. He said that God made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Now before we go on, I want to just tell you how amazing that is because he makes peace with every bit of creation, not just mankind, not just with the one who says yes to his, his gift of salvation. He says he, he makes all things good in all of creation. 
The, the creation is groaning, the scriptures say, that, 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 the, that the whole creation is fractured because of the sin of man, and he makes things, he heals them and restores them back by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. And then he gets personal, he starts talking about people, he starts talking about you in particular. He says, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy, this is a good place for an amen, you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Amen. This, yes. This is an amazing, amazing declaration. It's on the cross at Calvary where Jesus dies on the cross where he says you can be with me forever. That the free gift of eternal life is available because of what he's done on the cross of Calvary. It's at the cross where religion is crucified. Where God says no more sacrifices are needed. Where races are reconciled. Where all wrongs are made right. And it's where the resurrection becomes a reality for you. Because it's on the cross where Jesus makes, this one's for Jared, this is where Jesus makes his greatest sermon of all time. You ready, Jared? And it's a very short sermon. It's only three words. You guys know it? Say it. It is finished. Amen. That's the greatest sermon that Jesus ever, ever preached. Everything that the human soul needs for purpose fulfillment, peace, and joy is found and complete on the cross. But unfortunately, everyone around the world runs around like chickens with no head, trying to get right, trying to have a good life, trying to have good relationships and seek joy and find all this happiness and all these other things. And all the while, Jesus is screaming, what? It is, yeah, someone's got it. It, let me hear you all. It is finished. One more time. It is finished. Yes. Everything that man needs is all wrapped up on the cross at Calvary. All, see, like I said before, creation was fractured. All creation starts out way, way, way back, and it's all living in perfect relationship and harmony with its creator. As a matter of fact, Adam and Eve are just kind of running around. They're chilling in the garden. Everything's fine. They're hanging out. It's perfectly landscaped. They got all the trees that they want, all the birds that they want, all the, all the fruit and the vegetables, and, and there's no wild beasts trying to eat them. There's, it says there's no enmity between man and beast. Like, perfect harmony, God's hanging out, we're talking, peace and tranquility and scenery and perfect climate, and everything is great. As a matter of fact, Genesis 1.31 wraps it up perfectly. It says that God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. He saw that it was very good. See, when he, when he made separate things, he said, that was good. But when he looked at everything, he looked at it, he said, man, this is very good. Everything is perfect, but then sin enters the creation, and all of creation is then fractured, and it's not very good anymore. It's not very good anymore. Do you feel it? I mean, do you, do you feel it? Aches? and pains, loss, stress, horrific storms that kill people, wars that kill people, greed, divorce, fear, depression, anger, alcohol addiction, drugs, riots, social injustice, race tension, death, death. You know, and you know, when I say this, all this, this list, it's not like high theology, is it? It's experiential. We all feel it, right? I'm 46 years old today. Trust me, I feel it. <laughs> call, call, call Jameson to do something for you, and she'll just... I just want to sit down and rest. She just runs. That's just what her, her default mode is to run, because she has all this energy. You got that energy, Cheryl? <laughs> She's like... <laughs> Right? And, and you, who wakes up in the morning and, and does this with me? Oh, as you're getting out of bed. 
Oh, right? Oh. It's brutal, right? You just put on the TV. I mean, every person knows whether you're a believer or not that this world is completely jacked up. It's a mess. You know, way, way, way back, God said it. He said, if you sin, you will surely die. And then a long time later, and right up to this day, right into your face right now, he says the same thing. The wages of sin is death. Nothing has changed. Nothing's changed. And we do. We run around like chickens with no head, trying to make it better with all these different ways and sources and information and Oprah and stuff. And it's just not going to work. And Jesus said, it's finished. I made, I made a way for you to have peace and joy and fulfillment and purpose and happiness. And the ideal for all humanity is not some, like, um, Roman Empire. See, we all, there's a lot of people out there. I don't want to say all, but there's a lot of people out there that feel like that, that, that the ideal for humanity would be this, this, this Roman Empire, but it's a nice Roman Empire, you know? And everyone's Republican, and, and everyone's middle class, and everyone has a gun, and everyone is happy, okay? And, and, and no one wants anything, and that's just, you know, that's not where it's going to work. And and everyone has, what, sparkles? Yes, they have sparkles and universal health care, but it doesn't cost anything, and you get to go see your doctor whenever you want to, and it costs nothing. That your problem's the biggest problem, and the doctor's going to see you right away. That's just the ideal for all humanity, but it's really not. It's really not. See, there's a problem with all humanity, and I referenced it a moment ago. There's a singular problem that haunts the human heart, and it's found in the word singular. It's the first three letters. It's sin. That's the problem, and it's not going to be fixed with universal health care, and if everyone's a Republican, that's not going to work either. <clears throat> it's sin that revokes citizenship into the kingdom eternal for all people. So to participate in this resurrection, so you have to belong to him. You have to belong to him, and so we have to come up with a plan, because if we're ch chasing the chick like a chicken with no head, looking for stuff, and your plans aren't working, you've got to find the plan. So what's the plan What's the plan to belong to him so you can have the eternal kingdom at your disposal? Is it swords and shields? No. Is it science and high philosophy? No. Is it political embargoes and, 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 and hostile takeovers? And is it the stock market and whoever's the most money wins? And if I have enough houses and cash and if everyone's a Republican or if everyone's a Democrat, or if everyone is the Tea Party and, and, and free tax and, and we, that we, can, we can give ourselves to these things and it's going to be perfect, that's not it. So it's not the plan. The plan is disclosed in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 takes place seven, eight hundred years before Jesus comes to earth in the flesh. And it talks about God's plan. It says that the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. These hands have holes in them. These are the hands of Jesus Christ. God's plan will prosper in the hands of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isaiah 53 goes on to tell us that, that this Messiah would be despised and pierced, and crushed, and beaten, and whipped, unjustly condemned, and buried in a rich man's grave. And in 53.10, it just says this. This is the thing that people have a hard time with. It says in 53.10 that it was God's good plan to crush him on the cross. That was his plan, to crush him. He wasn't going to come with the sword or the spear and conquer the lands and take over the geography of the known world and, and put a cross in the ground like a flag and say, this is Jesus' turf. That's what they all wanted him to be. But that's not who he was. He had a plan. It's a perfect plan. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a perfect plan. It's a perfect plan. Jesus has a really good plan. It works. It's evidenced by the fact that 2,000 years ago, he virtually said you'd be sitting in this room, and you are. It works. It works. Right, Michael, you got it. It works. And see, 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 here's the thing. When he's crushed, what does he say? It's finished. It's a good plan. It's all worked out. But here's the problem. It's a dangerous spot for a lot of people to be in. They don't like this because it's not the Jesus that they thought of. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. They make up a Jesus that suits them. 
They're searching spiritually for, the, for what they think is real. And so it's based on what their mom or dad or grandpa told them or what they saw on TV or maybe on the History Channel or they heard this thing on the radio or my buddy goes to church and this is what they say. And so they make up a Jesus. They make up a God that suits them. And that's dangerous. Maybe he's a warrior king. Maybe he's a good moral teacher. Maybe he was created. Maybe, maybe it's a multiple choice savior. I can pick whichever one I want. I don't know. Maybe he's the genie in the bottle, Jesus. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a crowd favorite. Just, oh, Jesus, this is what I want. Help me out. And out comes Robin Williams. Maybe he's just the, 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 the this, this, I don't know, the fairy dust, Jesus. He's going to make everything better just the way I want. Everything's going to be just fine. Unfortunately, that's just not the way it goes. It is finished. He has a plan, right? Y'all said he's got a good plan and it works, right? See, Matthew 16, 13, you can go there if you want to. Matthew 16, take, take a look at that. See, what happens is, um, this is an interaction with Jesus and his disciples, and he's, he's going to disclose his plan once again. See, it was way back when that the plan was that he's going to be, hand, hand, be handed over to the, to the religious leaders, and he's going to be whipped and pierced and beaten and unjustly accused. He's going to be killed and he's going to rise again. That's just the plan. But people don't like that. And so here in Matthew 16, 13, he's with his disciples. And, and he looks at them and, and he says to the group, like let's say you guys are the disciples. And, and let's just pretend for a second, although I couldn't even come close, but I'll pretend that I'm Jesus. Hey guys, who, you've been hanging out with everybody in town. Who do, they, who do the people think that I am? Who do they say that I am? And so you guys start responding back, uh, well, some people think that, that you're John the Baptist, and some people think that you're um, Elijah, and some people think you're not Elijah, but you're one of them other prophets. And so they, they do a variety of different answers, and everybody's entitled to that. They can, they're entitled to your own choice. You can make a choice if you want, right or wrong. Everyone has the right to be wrong. But he, he, he kind of narrows it down a little bit. He's like, okay, you guys... That's what they say? Well, let me ask you a question. Who do you, uh, forget what they think. Who do you think that I am? And so Peter voices up, and he says, he's spot on. He says, you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the son of God. And, and Jesus is like, yep, you're right. You got it. You're a blessed man, Peter, because you know what? You didn't, you didn't put TV on and you didn't have to read a magazine and nobody like told you like God told you. My daddy told you. Like his spirit was speaking to you, yo, and you learned. And so you're right. You're a blessed man. So Peter was probably feeling pretty good about that. I mean, if Jesus came up to you and said, hey, you did the right thing, you'd be pretty happy about that, right? Would you agree? So you're probably flying pretty high, right, at that moment? And so Jesus goes, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. I am the Messiah, I'm the anointed one, right? So let me remind you again. So this is what's going to happen. Here's the game plan. I'm going to be I hand it over to the leading priests and the authorities, and they're going, to be, they're going to whip me and beat me, and they're going to kill me, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to raise again. And Peter's like, Jesus, come here. Did <laughs> you ever do that to one of your kids? But I'm doing, I'm never, come here. But I, come here. But, and Peter looks at him and goes, yeah, um, I know I said that you were like the anointed one of God, like the creator of heaven and earth, but your plan ain't going to work, dude. That's the definition of stupid. Okay, so, so it, the, the scriptures say that he, rep, he just told the guy, you're the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the living God, and then he reprimands him. Right? That's, that's dumb. And so, so, so Jesus, who, who a moment ago complimented Peter for getting it spot on, he calls him Satan. That's not going to make you feel real good. Right? So you go from really high to really low really quick. So he reprimands Jesus, right? But, but we joke about that. But, but that's kind of us. That's kind of society, right? Because because. Like, when you create your own Jesus that you think that this God should live up to this standard and it fails you, then, then you blame that deity or you, or you just think that there is no God or he doesn't hear you or he's not sufficient. So we, we have to know the real Jesus. 
See, Jesus calls us to follow him, doesn't he? But all too often, we call him to follow us. Because we make up our own Jesus. We decide who he should be based on hearsay, assumption, lack of research, lack of endeavoring to get to what Paul said, to know him. And that's what happens. And when that Jesus fails us, we got a big problem. And it's common. We need to know the Jesus of the Bible. And that's what we endeavor to help you with here at our church, to teach you, to introduce you to the Jesus of the Bible, the real true Jesus. Now again, you see Jesus does this again in Matthew 17. You can check it out. Go to Matthew 17, 22. Just so it's not like, you, see, you understand it's not an isolated situation where he, he, he discloses the plan. It's a good plan, right? You all said that. So, so, so in Matthew 17, after he gathers back up with his disciples in Galilee, Jesus unfolds the plan to them again. And he says, the son of man, referring to himself, is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He'll be killed, but on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. And look what, he, look what it says. And the disciples were just filled with grief. That's not the Jesus that we need. See, we know that that's the way they're feeling. I'll tell you why. Because like I reminded you last week, on the road to Emmaus, after he dies, the disciples, these two guys were walking along and they're talking about what had happened on the cross and Jesus hears them say this, Oh, we thought he was going to be the, the Messiah that was going to come and deliver us. See, they didn't, he didn't live up to what they thought he would be. They made up their own Jesus, the conquering king. And when he didn't live up to it and he got killed, he's got these crowds going. He's a rock star, this guy. He's got crowds growing like crazy. He's healing people and performing all these miracles, claiming to be the all-powerful one, but something was more powerful death and it killed them so they were discouraged they thought well this is not the real thing then so you see they were filled with grief you can see at the end of the story i think it's the end of mark where after this all unwinds he goes to the cross and all the disciples who used to be fishermen they gave up this life of being fishermen and they went to go be fishers of men and followers of christ but then he dies and what do they do well i guess we should just go fishing that's what happened read it so they just go fishing, and Jesus is like, eh, 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 and he shows up again. They have a fish fry. But you, so you can see, so when he says they're filled with grief, yeah, he wasn't living up to what they thought he should be. Then again, Matthew 26, you don't have to, we're not going to read this, but if you want to take a note and read it on your own later, Matthew 26, verses 47 through 56, here's the plan. The plan is I'm going to be handed over to the authorities, my enemies, the leading priest. They're going to torture me, kill me. I'm going to the grave, and I'm rising again. And so he told them this. Not only did they hear it, and these guys that he was with, they're all Jews. They knew about Isaiah 53, so they knew it was going to happen this way. Then he reiterates it's going to happen this way. This is who I am, and this is the plan, and they just don't want that. But now it's actually happening. He's in the garden, and here comes Judas, the betrayer, with, guess who? The soldiers that were sent by who? The leading priest and the teachers of religious law, just like Jesus had said would happen. And how do you make that happen unless you have serious power, right? So he actually, everything he said is now happening right in the garden. Judas comes and what happens when all this happens, when exactly what he said would happen, what happens in verse 56? It says, at that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. They, they, they just looked at this Jesus and like, this is not the way we want this to work. That is not the Jesus that I signed up for. I signed up to be part of the winning team that was going to kick Rome in the teeth and take over and set us free and Jesus would be king and I'd be sitting right next to him on the throne next to him. That's what people wanted, but that's not exactly what's going to happen. The disciples deserted him and they fled. Hey, that's not my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. 
See, Jesus had to die on that cross. Jesus had to die on that cross so that all people can be cleansed of sin. So he can make one nation, one kingdom of all people groups to get rid of all separations and divisions, to get rid of this whole separation of Jew and Gentile and circumcised and uncircumcised and, and, and slave and free and, and civilized and uncivilized. And he was going to call them in from the four corners of the earth in one nation, in one kingdom to rule and reign forever. He called us all so we could belong to him. And on the cross, it happened when he said, it is finished. This is my favorite holiday. So that death is dead. So that you and him and we can live together forever. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And like him, you'll be raised to new life because you put your trust in God who raised Christ from the dead. See, the harsh reality is that belonging to God is very, very expensive. It's very, very expensive. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And without forgiveness of sin, you will not be a part of the eternal kingdom of God because sin results in death. Jesus Christ is the perfect Lamb of God whose one sacrifice on the cross for all people, for all people, groups, for every sin, for every person on earth, for all time. And those who accept this gift of forgiveness, they look to the cross in awe and wonder, why would Jesus bleed and die so that I could live? You look at the cross in awe, I don't know where your heart is, but I do. Like, why would he do that for me? Do you ever stop and think about that? Why would this one who absolutely will reign forever, was there before time, before all things are created, before you were even here, existing as God, and if you never ever repented, not a single person repented and never joined him, he'd still be God. So why would he come and go through such torture and torment so that you could live. See, if, if, if nothing else happens in this time as we gather tonight, then you think about that, then mission accomplished. That's, ins- that's not, like Francis Chan's book, Crazy Love, it's beyond crazy. It's insane. It's insane. I don't know, perhaps it's my own bias or, or perhaps it's my, my own tainted past that just screams, you don't deserve his love, Moses. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. I, I don't know what it is. But anytime I preach Christ on the cross and him crucified, or anytime these guys sing, you know, lead me to the cross where his love poured out, anytime we do that, it just, it makes me cry. It just drives me crazy. When I was writing it, it was making me cry. It's making me cry now. I don't understand me. I don't understand that. It's not him turning water into wine that, that, that makes me cry. It doesn't, it does, it's not him feeding 5,000 people with a Happy Meal on the hill that, that makes me cry. It's not the thing that got me into heaven because he cast a demon out of some crazy freak in a, in a, in a, in a cemetery. It's not because he, he went to paralyze people and now they get to walk. It's not that he touched someone with, with leprosy and now they're cured or, or blind people can see. Those things are all awesome. But it's, it's the cross. It's the cross. It's why I belong. It's why I belong. It's the wrath of God that would sink all humankind to hell, fully absorbed by the love of God that offers all of humankind heaven. It's Jesus in my place. How can you do anything except say yes? How can you do anything except say yes? Where's our Cree? I want to pray with you. And as in, in, in normal form in our church, everything's completely unorganized. But it doesn't matter because someone is saying yes. And so we have a reason to celebrate. Come on up, guys. We're going to sing. 
We're not taking an offering. You can put it in the boxes. You can give online. You can give on the computer, whatever. We're not going to do that. We're going to take communion in a few minutes. One of these days, we're going to get these girls in there. We're going to have someone get baptized. That's just the way we are here. We're going to get, gather some guys up. We'll give out communion to here in a minute. Come on up, Justice. Play drums. Play the box. It's Jesus Christ on the cross. It's the most amazing day in all of history. It's the reason why you belong. It's the reason why Easter even has any meaning. It's because you get to enjoy being part of that resurrection because of what he did on the cross. Go ahead and hand it all out. Hand it out. Go ahead. But I want you to do me a favor. Before we take communion, Kelly's going to come up and he's going to lead us in communion, taking the, the elements. But I want you to take a few minutes before he says anything, and I want you to just take a few moments and think about that. Think about why the great love that's shown. Why would he go to the cross that you might live? Just think about that. Crazy, right? Take a few minutes and just ponder that, and then Kelly's going to come up and We'll take communion as a family together. And then please stay as we see someone say yes.